Today, like Rod said, we're going to start out in Romans, Romans chapter 14. Romans was written by Paul, P as in Paul. I had to do that for uh, Steve because doing my mic check this morning, I just happened to say Paul, P, P, Paul, P as in Paul, and he started laughing. He's like, you got to do that this morning. So anyway. I really have been blessed to be able to get the even chapters somehow in Romans. So these, uh, they're all great, but uh, I've really, really enjoyed being able to study for these. So as we start out, well, first of all, last week I was gone on what's called a men's encounter weekend through Encounter Ministries. A very good friend of mine that I was born and raised with, he, uh, he sent me a message and said, hey, I really want you to come to this men's encounter with me. And I thought, all right, cool, maybe 30, 40 guys, no problem. And I got there and there was 1,100, 1,100 guys there. I was like, what? I immediately called my wife and said, baby... Um, there are a lot, a lot of guys here. I really need you to pray for me because contrary to maybe popular belief, I don't do great in crowds. Well, my wife says I do great in crowds, but on the inside, I'm going, ah! So, um, but it was extremely beneficial. It was an absolutely wonderful weekend of, of truly encountering Jesus. There was everybody from, uh, from preachers to prisoners, from... You know, Christians to crack addicts there. And we got to experience freedom, breakthrough. Um, we got to experience, you know, 1,100 men passionately worshiping our Savior. And I think that that's something that we are desperately lacking. Desperately lacking in our, in our country. Um, and in our world today, really, because the world is, is pushing so hard for us to, to want to make ourselves happy, to find ourselves. That's the biggest crock of, um, you know, that, that I've ever heard of. Because to truly find happiness, to truly find joy, peace, all of those things, we're not going to find it in ourselves and that's a fact. I've searched there. It's not there. You've probably searched there, and it's not there. The only place that we can find it is through a true, passionate relationship with Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is it. And so to see these guys, and, and I myself as well, all worshiping together and taking control of, through the Spirit, of the things that bind us up, the things that have, have held us, in addictions and in, in sin and in shame and whatever it is, to see these guys, all of us binding those things through the Spirit of Jesus Christ who sets us free and because of the blood that He shed for our freedom, to see them nailing this stuff to the cross and receiving true freedom. I'm talking addictions being broken left and right. Actual healings taking place. Um, guys, eyesight literally coming back literally i mean sitting there talking to you and then all of a sudden they're like everything's all fuzzy they take their glasses off and they can see clearly and they're like what <laughs> there was a guy there this past week that uh um that he got prayed for at the last encounter and received uh healing in his vision and he came up and prayed for a friend of mine that got healed as well but uh he didn't have glasses on, and he said that literally that happened. Like, they were just hanging out, praying, and, and somebody asked him if he wanted healing for anything, and he's like, sure, I want healing for my eyes. I want to be able to see clearly again. And so they prayed, and boom, he was able to see clearly. That is, that's our God. That's our God, overcoming things that, that physically are impossible, that humanly are impossible. You know, God, the Word tells us that... that with man, these things are impossible. 
But with God, all things are possible. And that all things mean that there's not a single thing that is not possible for him. Not a single thing. That's powerful stuff, man. So today, really before we get into Romans chapter 14, I just want all of you to pray with me to break the spirit of division. The spirit of division, because that's, that's really what chapter 14 is about. Satan comes to divide, to divide us against each other, against, from Christians against Christians, because a house divided cannot stand, can it? Of course it can't. It's not structurally sound, so it can't. And that's what he's been trying to do from the beginning. We've seen a spirit of division uh, in and amongst this church, but not just this church, every church, the whole church. That's who Satan's wanting to go after, to steal from us, to kill us, to destroy us, our health, ourselves personally, our morals, our values, our standards, but also the whole church. He wants to pit us against each other so that we cannot stand. He doesn't need us to become Satan worshipers. He doesn't want any of us, any of us, to find our strength in Him. Like I said, He doesn't need us to become Satan worshipers. He just needs us to not worship the one true God. He just needs us to let offense come in. To let anger or malice or resentment or fear, envy. He wants all these things to come in so that it causes division to split us. And that's the fact. All right, so let's pray against the spirit of division. Good morning, Father. God, we love you. We thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you know the cries of our hearts and the deep desires of our hearts, Lord. I thank you, God, that these prayers that we pray today go up to your throne room, God, as a sweet aroma to you, Lord. I pray, God, that, that by the prayers of these saints, Lord, that you will bind the spirit of division, and we bind the spirit of division in the name of Jesus Christ. And we command it to get out of our lives, to get out of our minds, to get out of our hearts, to get out of this church, out of the church in general, the body of Christ. God, we just command it to be bound and thrown out in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. So the last, the last couple verses of Romans 13 say, Because we belong to the day or to this world, the day that we live in right now, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, instead of all of those things, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Paul knows that it's easy to think about things, ways to indulge our evil desires, so he tells us not to. It's easy because it gives us that real quick gratification, that self-gratification. But guys, I'll tell you the truth. When you gratify yourself instantly, it might taste great for a second, but then it turns to gravel in your mouth. It turns to gravel in your stomach. It turns gross and disgusting. And if we are focusing on indulging our own self and our own fleshly desires, then that takes our focus and our eyes off of the Creator who loves us and wants to have this personal, intimate relationship with us. We can't look at Him and the things of the world at the same time. We can't. That's why He tells us to do this. The very first word of chapter 14 is accept. Accept, accepting. It says, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. The first word there being accept, 
means consent to receive something, so receiving them, being willing to receive them, or accept can mean believe or come to recognize an opinion or an explanation, etc., whatever else it could be, as valid or correct. Except that somebody else's opinion could be valid. It might even be correct. And God clarifies what He means here. Whenever He says, for instance, one person thinks that it might be alright to eat something and somebody else might not. So back then, what, what Paul was talking about here was there was a lot of meat that was being sacrificed to all the other gods and then sold in the marketplace. So they brought their, these pagans brought their, their sacrifice and they made the sacrifice to their wicked gods. But then, that sacrifice, they still wanted to profit off that sacrifice, so they took the meat to the market and sold it to the general public. And the Christians at the time, and the Jews, said, well, we can't eat that, that's defiled. It's defiled, it's no longer appropriate for us to be able to eat it. So they wouldn't eat it, but some Christians knew that Jesus came, and His blood covers all of this. And that it is okay for them. Jesus says that, that, um, that it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. And people find that really hard to believe. But believe it or not, we have a God that's bigger, greater, stronger, more powerful to heal, to make us cleansed, to redeem us, to forgive us, to make even the, the most vile thing holy and righteous as long as we are doing it unto Him and not unto something else, whether it be those gods or whatnot. Just because Paul here uses meat He's trying to paint a broader picture for us. And we can all really easily get caught up in this, this moment of believing that what somebody else does is not good, is not righteous. We can easily start condemning other people for all different kinds of things. For all different kinds of things, whether it's, you know, trick-or-treating, or eating meat, or painting Easter eggs, or drinking an alcoholic beverage, whatever it is. You can put whatever that you want to put on there, but let's look at what God, what God truly says here. He says, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. It says, we must not look down on those who don't. It doesn't say we probably shouldn't. It says we must not. And then it says, and for those who don't, who don't eat certain foods, they must not condemn those who do. Listen to this. For God has accepted them. God has accepted those who do things Maybe in the way that, and let me clarify this. This is, this is things that he specifically says. I'm not talking about morals and, and those types of things. I'm not talking about anything morale, um, morality-based. I'm talking about what he does not clearly state in his word. God has accepted them. And then he, he throws this in there. He says, who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Someone else's servant. Woo! So, this says, accept other believers. God is telling us, listen, we have to pay attention to the other people, the other believers, the other Christians, those that are going after me. This is who He's talking about, that we accept, that we that we 
do our very best not to come into conflict with because they're children of the Most High God and they are all His servants. You aren't my servants. I can't judge you or condemn you. You're His servants. And I'm His servant. So you can't judge me or condemn me. This doesn't mean that we don't preach the truth, that we don't lay out the truth. That's not what that means at all. We have to deliver the truth, but we have to deliver the truth in love. He says, their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive His approval. It says, with His help, they will stand and receive His approval. It doesn't say that Nathan's going to come up and Nathan's going to be the one to judge and determine whether or not they stand approved or not. It's absolutely not the case, is it? Thank goodness. It says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. I don't know what your word, what your Bible says, but it says whatever day you choose is acceptable. So if I've chosen this day to be my Sabbath day, and for me to rest on it, then that's my Sabbath day. It's okay if it's not the same Sabbath day that you have, or you have, or you have. It's okay. God has brought that conviction to me, and I treat it as holy, just as you treat your day as holy. So we shouldn't allow that to come in and cause a wedge and be a divisive factor that separates God's people. It can't be. This message, I wanted to, I wanted to title it, Want to Please God? Build one another up. If you want to please God, build one another up. Don't tear each other down. I'll get to that more here in just a minute. Those who worship the Lord on a special day, do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food, do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating it. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. This reminds me of a story in John chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. This is Jesus at um, Jacob's well in Samaria. He's speaking with a woman here at the well, and... All of a sudden, he tells her how many husbands she's had. The one that she's living with now isn't her husband. And all of a sudden, she realizes, Oh, sir, you must be a prophet. And if you can tell me all these things, I've had a burning question in my heart because it's divided the Samaritans and the Jews for all this time. She finds out that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is among her, that that he's a prophet and he can tell her anything, and she has one question. Should we worship here on this mountain or in Jerusalem? Because that's what's caused this massive rift between the Samaritans and the Jews for all this time. And listen to what Jesus, uh, she, I'll tell you what she says and then what he says. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, this is his reply, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He goes on in verse 23, he says, But the time is coming, indeed, it's here right now. It's here right now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. If the time was there at that time, it's here at this time. This was Jesus speaking before He even went to the cross. He said, the time is now to worship Me wherever you are. Don't let these borders be put up between you and God. Worship. Worship freely. It says, For we do not live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it is to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord of both the living and the dead. So, why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will stand before the judgment seat of God. For Scripture say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Each of us will give a personal account to God. So stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Whenever he says that if we live, we live to honor God, it brings me to um, Galatians 2.20, where um, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. The old me is dead. It's dead and gone. I now live to glorify the Father. And that's what we have to do, is glorify the Father. Guys, listen. If we spend so much time fixated and focused on how other people worship, God, then are we truly fixated and focused on the one that truly wants our worship and our praise? No. His relationship with them is His relationship with them. Our relationship with Him is our relationship with Him. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Him. Galatians 6, 2 also says it's, it's a command for us to carry each other's burdens and in the same way, fulfill the law of Christ. How can we carry each other's burdens if we're so worried about the life that they're living, even though Christ died for them? He says, in this way, we will fulfill the law of Christ. Man, that is super powerful. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3 through It says, if I could speak with all the languages of earth and the languages of angels, but don't love other people, I'd only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all God's secret plans, and if I possessed all knowledge, and I understand all of Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. God's secret plans and possess all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move this mountain, but I didn't love other people, I'd be nothing, literally nothing at all. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my own body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. Jesus says, if you walk exactly like I walk, but you don't walk in love, if you do all the physical things right, but your heart is not for people but against people, because you're dealing with pride and arrogance and whatever, it's not going to gain you a single thing. Nothing. You can do all the right things, say all the right things, but without love, you've failed. You failed. 
This is a super hard pill to swallow, for me anyway. You know, after I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps, I was doing a lot of different work all over the country and all over the world, and I was living with my Uncle Randy and Aunt Beth, my mom's oldest brother and his wife. And they really wanted me to go to church with them. And I really wanted to party on Saturday nights. So... I did party on Saturday nights. They didn't, they weren't out there preaching at me, bashing me over the head with the word. I mean, I grew up in the same church as them. They knew that I knew the word inside and out. But they lovingly, consistently encouraged me. Lovingly, consistently invited me to come to church. They consistently showed the love of Christ to me. So I did start going to church, even though I was still going out and smelling like a brewery whenever I got there. But they were showing me the love. They weren't condemning me. They weren't telling me how bad I was all the time, even though I was and they knew it. But they were consistently loving on me, and they were consistent. Even though the first time they asked, I didn't go. I probably didn't go the second, third, or fourth time but they consistently, lovingly asked me to come. And so then I did. And God really started to work on my life, work on my heart. There were people praying for me because prayer literally works. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody say, well, all we can do is pray? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, that's absolutely the number one best thing you can do. When I have problems and I have issues or I have struggles, something that I'm really dealing with, I call these people in here, my friends, because I know they're going to pray and I know that prayer changes things. I know that it does. But we're called to love people. Okay, We're called to care for people. And if we, if we truly are concerned about someone else's actions, we need to ask ourselves, is it a moral issue or is it something that's between them and God? Is God actually asking me to bring this up or not? And I want to read you guys the, the fruits of the Spirit, but I want to put them in a way that maybe you haven't heard them before. Because this absolutely applies to us. It applies to you so please listen carefully. When you go to deal with anybody, when you go to speak with anybody, when you go to live your life like Christ does, I encourage you to choose love. Celebrate joy. Seek peace. Have patience. Offer kindness. Value goodness. Encourage faithfulness. Practice gentleness and honor self-control. First Corinthians thirteen thirteen tells us that these three things will last forever: faith, hope, and love. They're going to last forever. But the greatest of these is love. Paul says, I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. He tells us that he's convinced 100%. On the authority of Jesus, how would Paul be able to talk on the authority of Jesus? How would he be able to make a statement that on the authority of Jesus himself, that he knows that, these, that all food is clean and is, that it's not um, sinful for us to partake. Well, if we jump back to Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said, 
Go, he's speaking to Ananias. He says, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message, my message, Jesus is telling him he's taking my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Jesus specifically told Ananias that Paul is carrying forth his message. That's why Paul can say right here that it's on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But he clarifies it. He says, but if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. It might not be wrong for you, but it's wrong for them because they believe that it's wrong. He says, and if another person, if another believer, believer, Christian, is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. You're not acting in love if you eat it in front of them anyway. Don't let your eating ruin someone from whom Christ died. How could that ruin someone? It's not saying if you're in your house all by yourself having a steak, but yet somebody else thinks that it's a sin to eat steak. If they don't know that you're eating that steak, then so be it. You're not sinning because you're not causing them to stumble. You can still eat the steak and be perfectly fine. But if you're going around eating it in front of them, telling them, you're stupid, you should, you should be able to eat this too, you can't eat this too, yet they've been convicted not to do it, then don't do it in front of them. You can replace steak with whatever else that you think is necessary. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what life is all about. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you as well. That's why I wanted to name this, Want to Please God? <laughs> then build one another up. Don't tear them down. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. That's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Don't tear apart the work of God. Some people would say, you can't tear apart the work of God. Well, if that were the case, why would God put it in here? By your actions, by causing someone else to stumble, you tear apart the work of God. The Bible specifically tells us that if we harm these little children, and I think... What he means there, whenever he says these little children, I think he's, he's being literal and figurative. Little children can't help themselves. They're vulnerable. They're easy to fall prey to a, to a predator of any sort. In the same way, when he says these little children, if you cause these little children to stumble... When he says little children, I also believe that he's being figurative by speaking of new Christians, Christians that aren't solid in their faith, that don't know the Word of God, that, that don't stand on it consistently. These are new Christians, and they're easy, easily fall prey to the enemy. If once we dedicated our heart and our life and our soul to God, we couldn't be stolen from, killed, or destroyed then God would never tell us to put on the full armor of God. He would never tell us to continue to seek Him first. He wouldn't have to tell us. Because we wouldn't do anything to have to stand against the enemy and prepare for battle. But the Word tells us that if someone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it's better to have a millstone tied around their neck and to be thrown into the depths of the ocean, that's pretty, that's pretty tough, isn't it?
Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, remember, all foods are acceptable. But it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. Remember that we shouldn't do things to excess. No matter what, we shouldn't. Okay, because it's bad. It's bad for us. It's bad for our witness. The Word tells us not to be a glutton, not to be a drunkard, not to do all these things in excess. We shouldn't. Especially if by doing them in excess is going to be very, very bad for us. But it doesn't mean that you can't eat specific things or drink specific things unless God has convicted you not to. And if He has convicted you not to, it is 100% a sin to do it. It is better to not eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe that there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Don't we always want to get up on our pedestal? <laughs> you know? And maybe even for for the right heart reasons, you want somebody to be free from, from something. You want them to not feel the conviction, the condemnation, whatever it is. You want them maybe to have the freedom in that that, that that God has given you. But the Word says that God Himself brings the conviction. That the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts. And last I checked, none of us are the Holy Spirit. So unless God specifically tells you to do something, you need to keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But, there's that big but, if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. Even if you have doubts about it, if you're questioning whether or not you should. God will give you the freedom when He chooses to give you the freedom. That release. And you will know, it's okay for me to do this. If you have that check in your spirit, then it's not okay for you to do it. If you really want to, pray about it and ask God to remove that check. If He does, He does. If He doesn't, then He doesn't want that for you. Believe it or not, God knows what we can handle and what we can't handle. Better than we know ourselves. For you are not following your convictions if you go ahead and do it. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. So that's the very last verse in Romans chapter 14. If you do anything you believe is not right, then you are sinning. Mark 7, 15 through 37. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come here. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. Take some time and think about it, basically. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. I think that's pretty, pretty powerful. Also, let's look at John 13, verse 35. John 13, verse 35. This was a verse that Trinity actually sent me while I was um, down at the weekend, the men's encounter weekend. I'm actually going to start a little bit farther up in verse 33. 
13 verse 33 says, Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer, him physically. And as I told you, the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another, so this is really what I want to emphasize, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. By the way that we love one another. Does, it, does anybody's Bible says, by the way that you judge one another, you'll be known that you're my disciples? Mine doesn't. And if yours does say judge one another, then <laughs> we need to talk about that. But it says your love for one another will prove, the, prove to the world that you are my disciples. Man, that's seriously important. I believe that the times that we live in right now, they're difficult, they're dangerous, they're deadly. The times that we live in right now, like what Brittany was talking about, praying for Israel and supporting Israel. I do believe that it's biblical for us to pray for them and to support them in every way that we can. But we need to also be praying for and supporting the Christians all around us, lifting one another up daily, praying for one another. In whatever way we can support each other, we need to be doing it, mentally, physically, emotionally. It's extremely important. And I, I want the world around us to see us and know that we are His disciples. I want the people around us to see the way that I treat you and know that we are Jesus' disciples and know that I love Jesus just by the way that I treat you other Christians around me. There was a... A statement that was read to me over this past weekend that I want to read it to you guys because I believe that it is absolutely um, appropriate for us. And I think that it's very, very important that we think about this. So please listen. And I'll close with this. So please listen carefully. If you don't become a reconciler of the lost... You will become an evaluator of the saved. There is something inherent in our nature that He wants to see, that we want to see people get right with God. And if we don't direct it at the lost, we will direct it at the saved. Then, instead of pursuing sinners, we will spend our time policing the saints. All of us have been called to be fishers of men. But when those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. When energy that was meant to be used outside the church is used inside the church, the result is explosive. Instead of becoming reachers of the lost, we become critics of the saved. Instead of helping the hurting, we hurt the helpers. And sadly... The lost go unreached, the poor go unfed, and the confused go unconsoled. But when those who are called to fish, fish, they flourish. Souls are reached, lives are changed, and the world is impacted. I don't know about you, but that hit me like a ton of bricks. We spend a lot of time in here, and we need to, we should, it's good. But we've got to determine where we're going to focus our energies, and who we're going to focus our energies on, who God has called us to focus our energies on. Why would anyone want to come in here if they just see us fighting and bickering and arguing and telling each other how wrong we are all the time. Let's encourage one another. Let's lift each other up. 
Let's make an impact in the world. Let's love like no one else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. We thank you for your word that sets us free. God, Galatians 5.1 says that it is for freedom that you have set us free. For freedom itself that you have set us free, God. Help us to walk in your freedom. Help us to walk in your victory over sin, shame, death, and the grave. God, please help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to watch our mouths. Help us to watch the way that we see one another. God, please help us to encourage one another and not tear each other down. God, I pray that you will give us the strength to walk in your love and that all of our actions, God, will be coming from an overflow of love through us, God. Lord, I pray that we will be willing and obedient servants of yours, that we will realize that we truly have died to ourselves and that we live only through you and your grace, your mercy, and your love and forgiveness, God. Help us to be obedient in every step we take and every word that comes out of our mouth, God. We love you, Lord, and we live for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.